Since 2010, the Gowanus Canal was added to the Superfund list of EPA. And what does that mean? That means that is highly polluted, that is highly contaminated, and that we want to return the Gowanus Canal to a waterway where all the communities in New York City and the Board of Brooklyn could be proud. And so we want to have and implement a comprehensive plan to clean up the Gowanus Canal. But in order for it to succeed, we have to work together, all the communities, and we need to engage everyone. And this is not what EPA wants to plan and execute without the input from the community. And that is why we are here tonight. Tonight, I asked uh, Judith Enk, uh, the regional administrator of EPA, who has done an extraordinary job at engaging the different communities that are impacted by the Gowanus Canal, and Walter Mudgan, and Crystal, and I forgot your name, I'm sorry, Natalie. She's the community coordinator, and there hasn't been any meeting taking place throughout the different communities where most of the people that are at this table has not been. They have always been there, reaching out and answering all the questions and asking for you to provide your input and to react to uh, the proposed remedial action plan to clean up the Gowanus Canal. So we have been joined by council member Steve Levin, who I know play an important role throughout Sandy relief effort. While I was in Red Hook, he was here. And um, I am happy to say that we fought hard. The Republicans who didn't want to support a $60 billion package uh, to provide the relief, um, the disaster relief resources that we need in order to help Marin. I just would like to introduce to you Judith Enk, and I welcome everyone else. We want this to be open to everyone and the surrounding communities around the Gowanus. But I just would like to uh, present in a formal way uh, our administrator, because not only she has done, and she has an incredible record of progressive actions uh, when it comes to the environment not only throughout the Gowanus, but also in other communities that have been facing environmental degradation, such as Puerto Rico, Vieques, and Culebras. But Judith Enk was appointed regional administrator of Region 2 by President Barack Obama. Previously, she was deputy secretary of the environment in the New York State Governor's Office. As regional administrator, Judy's responsibility are wide ranging. In cooperation with state and regional authorities in New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Island, and seven federally recognized Indian nations, region two administer federal programs from air and water pollution to industrial discharges, protection of stream, lakes, the ocean, you name it, anything that is water, is land, uh, has to deal with uh, environmental uh, degradation, uh, Judith Inc. is uh, responsible uh, to oversee. She is managing a staff of about 900 people, profession, professionals, including engineering, law, chemistry, biology, public affairs, and overseeing an annual budget of $700 million, that without the sequester impact. So we're gonna be fighting to make sure that if we don't increase it, at least we do not uh, decrease that amount. So let me introduce to you Judith Enk, and she will uh, explain the remedial proposed plan. And I just invite everyone, but particularly the tenants from this area, to ask questions. We know that the Gowanus Canal could directly impact this community. You saw it when Sandy hit this area. 
uh, overflow, CSOs. Um, I know that some of the tenants cannot conduct your meetings in your offices because of, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is the person, and then we have the city here in the able person of Steve Levin because the city must be a proactive partner in this cleanup effort. So thank you very much, and I introduce to you Judith Eng. As the Congresswoman mentioned, um, the Environmental Protection Agency is the federal agency in charge of keeping our environment clean. Um, we have a regional office in Lower Manhattan, and all of you should get to know Natalie Loney, who is our um, public um, liaison, who obviously needs no introduction. Um, and also with EPA, Christos uh, Samios is going, um, Samamis is going to talk to you in detail about um, the cleanup and my colleague Walter Mugden is the head of our Superfund program um, for the whole region. And we've got a whole bunch of federal Superfund sites in New York and New Jersey and Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Um, I really want to thank the Congresswoman for um, not only organizing this great meeting, but also for her constant attention to environmental health issues and pollution issues, not only in her district, uh, but nationwide. I mean, I don't think you could have a more um, well-informed, engaged, or spirited fighter for you, and you're lucky that you have uh, this neighborhood represented uh, by the congresswoman. I know the other congresswoman was also wonderful. I think all the congresswomen are wonderful. Yeah. If, if only that could change a little in Washington. Um, but she is a really fierce advocate for the public interest and uh, we look forward to working even closer with her and her staff. And um, Councilman uh, Levin has been very, very engaged in local pollution issues, public health issues. Yeah. And we appreciate that. Because really, um, fighting pollution is about protecting our health uh, and protecting our children's health. And I think that's probably uh, one reason why you all turned out tonight. Uh, we know during Hurricane Sandy, the Gowanus went over the banks. Um, EPA went out and did some sampling. I, um, I walked uh, all around the canal in this neighborhood the day after Sandy. I, I live in Bed-Stuy, and I came over and um, saw the damage, and you know my heart really goes out to so many people who were directly impacted and who are still struggling uh, with the damage from Sandy. And the last thing you want to worry about is a federal Superfund site going over its banks and bringing pollution to your homes or your businesses when you've got so much else going on. So we did some sampling. The good news is we didn't see uh, toxic chemicals that went over the banks, but we did see sewage. And that's probably not a surprise to you who live in this community. I think Sandy reminds us of the need uh, to clean up the canal. As the Congresswoman mentioned, the Gowanus Canal is a relatively new addition to the federal Superfund list. Superfund basically means it's a toxic waste site, even if it's in the water. These are, th if you're a federal Superfund site, that means you are the most uh, toxic waste site in the nation. There's also a state Superfund, which affects this neighborhood. Um, and unfortunately, there are just way too many <clears throat> toxic sites and super sun, super fun sites all over New York and New Jersey. In fact, New York has the third most in the nation, 116 federal Superfund sites. The way Superfund works is we try not to gobble up tax dollars on the cleanup, because these cleanups can be quite expensive. Uh, first, we look for the parties that created the pollution and we get them to pay for the cleanup. And at the Gowanus Canal, we have more than 20 different businesses or parties that contributed to the pollution. So we'll be going to them to finance the cost of the cleanup. The two major responsible parties we're dealing with are the City of New York and also National Grid. And we appreciate their cooperation in moving forward on this cleanup. It's gonna happen better and it's gonna happen quicker if um, the parties that created the pollution work closely 
with the government and the community on finding solutions, and that's what this is all about. The EPA's role is to make sure that the cleanup is fully protective of public health and the environment. And the way I look at the Gowanus Canal cleanup is there is really two parts. First, we have a lot of contamination in the, the mud or the sediment on the bottom of the canal. That needs to be addressed. But we also need to reduce the amount of raw sewage that goes into the canal, especially after it rains. Um, we, th this canal has been battered by literally decades and decades of pollution going into it. We have found more than a dozen toxic contaminants uh, in the canal and also lots of raw sewage. Unfortunately, the raw sewage carries something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and I don't expect you to spell that, but it is a, a health risk along with PCBs, heavy metals that we're finding in the sediment. And just for you to understand how serious the contamination is in the Gowanus Canal, at other federal Superfund sites that EPA works on, we usually measure chemicals in parts per million or sometimes parts per trillion, so very minute uh, levels of pollution. Here in the Gowanus Canal, so close to where people live and work, we're finding uh, pollution in parts per hundred. So um, that is a pretty serious threat and why it, it is a good thing to have this on the Superfund program. Um, in the deeper levels of the sediment at the bottom of the canal, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons have been measured as high as 4.6 parts per hundred. And that is a concern because this level of contamination potentially can make people sick. The PAHs that I talked about are suspected carcinogens. <clears throat> PCBs impact our ability to learn. They're a neurotoxin, so just how when children are exposed to lead, uh, their ability to learn is affected. Same thing with PCBs, whether it's um, in the canal or unfortunately we know that um, there are old school buildings that have PCBs and lighting fixtures and EPA is working to make sure that kids are not exposed to PCBs in the schools. Cleaning up this canal is not going to be cheap. It'll cost roughly half a billion dollars and another $78 million to make sure that the raw sewage from the combined sewer overflow doesn't recontaminate the canal after we do the cleanup. So I know this gets a little dense um, and there's toxic contamination, there's also raw sewage from CSOs, but you need to understand uh, both of those issues. And combined sewer overflows or CSOs what happens is whenever it rains heavily, raw sewage will not go to the sewage treatment plant, but it mixes with the stormwater pipes, and you get all that raw sewage going directly into the canal. And if you want to learn more about sewage contamination from combined sewage overflow, EPA recently put out this really little thin report. You can read it over coffee in the morning with a nice title, Keeping Raw Sewage and Contaminated Stormwater Out of the Public's Water. That's a pretty good goal, right? And we have to do that with the Gowanus Canal. We've got to deal with the toxic contamination and the raw sewage because we don't want all these parties to spend all this money on the cleanup and then have it recontaminated if we don't solve the problem with the combined sewer overflow. If there's a silver lining in all of this toxic contamination, it's that um, environmental cleanups create jobs. I've done a lot of work over the years, as has Walter and others, in getting PCBs out of the Hudson River uh, in upstate New York. That Superfund cleanup created 500 new jobs in upstate New York. And we think um, that Superfund is just a really good way uh, to promote local jobs as well. And that's something that EPA is interested in doing, is not uh, just looking at jobs in general, but how can we provide uh, local jobs. We want to disrupt the neighborhood as little as possible. Uh, where we are in the process, and, and you'll hear in greater detail, is where we want to hear your comments on what you think um, this cleanup should look like. We have um, comment cards that are available in the room today 
where you can um, email or contact us. Uh, put your thoughts in writing. It's a lot better than a phone call. And Natalie and, and Christos and, uh, can give you the details. Um, but we really want to encourage all of you uh, to answer questions. If you don't get an answer tonight, just call us up. You know, we're not far away. We're available to come back and meet with the community again. I deeply appreciate the Congresswoman and her staff organizing this meeting. Um, we want to hear from you. And while the canal is not that long compared to, say, the Hudson River, there are very distinct neighborhoods all along the way, all with unique um, challenges and unique perspectives, and we really wanted to hear from you. We are government bureaucrats, and so we speak in a special language that may be difficult to understand. I'm gonna just walk through a little bit for you. Um, these sites all around the country are nominated typically by the states. We evaluate them if they reach a certain level of hazardousness, of danger, we can put them on the Superfund list. That's what we did with the Gowanus Canal in the year 2010, as you heard. Um, the first step once a site is on the list is to do something called a remedial investigation. And this is a detailed study where we go out and we take a lot of samples. In this case of the Gowanus Canal, we took samples of the water. We took a lot of samples of the mud at various depths. We took samples of what was coming into the canal from the combined sewer overflows from the properties near the canal. We have information about them. Some of those in years past were used for industrial operations that also used generate a lot of pollution. A lot of that pollution ended up in the canal. So we had to evaluate all those things very, very carefully. We had to look at the critters in the canal, the uh, little tiny critters that get eaten by the bigger things that get eaten by the bigger things. We looked at the fish, we looked at crabs, and yes, there are some fish and there are some crabs in the canal. And this is a concern because there are also people who are eating the fish that live in the canal or live near the canal. Uh, we've seen it, we've talked to people. There's a fishing pier at the mouth of the canal, and uh, we've spoken to people there who have fished, and uh, we've asked them, uh, what do you do with the fish? Do you take them home and eat them? And they've said, yep. But if we have a good day like today, we'll sell the excess to the restaurants. So we want to be very careful. We're concerned about the fish. Um, so this remedial investigation is the first step. And Christos Tsiamis, who is the project manager for this site, he oversaw the remedial investigation during the year, basically during the year 2010. The next step after that's done is to do something called a feasibility study where the remedial investigation tells you what the problems are, the feasibility study says, here's a bunch of different ways that you might be able to resolve the problem or address the problem. <clears throat> and it's an engineering study to say, how would these different alternatives work? How much would they cost? How complicated would they be? What are the pros and cons of each one? And Christos oversaw the feasibility study being carried out during the year 2011. And then the next step after the feasibility study was done was to say, okay, now it's up to EPA to propose the selection of one of those alternatives and to go to the public, to go to you and everybody else who lives in the community and say, all right, we evaluated five, six, seven different alternatives, whatever it is, and we think the right one to select is this one, and here's why. And we did that at the end of December 2012, so three months ago. <coughs> Excuse me. The next step, and that's the step we're in right now, is having done that proposal and putting it forward, is to go to the communities, and we've done it on a number of meetings over the last two months, is to go to the communities and say, we're gonna tell you a little bit about the plan, and Christos is gonna do that in about one minute, and we want your feedback. We want to hear what you are concerned about. We want to hear what your questions are. We want to try and answer them. There is a formal official legal comment period during which any member of the public, anybody, groups, individuals can give us comments. And that comment period extends, started at the beginning of, uh, at the end of December, and it runs through April 27th. 
So exactly one more month from the day. So you got plenty of time if you're interested in making comments. Got plenty of time to submit those comments, but please do it before the 27th. After the 27th, the comment period is closed. We then have to look at all those comments and think about them. And <clears throat> we will eventually select one of those alternatives, either the one we proposed or a different one or some different combination if the comments have caused us to change anything. And when we've concluded that deliberation internally, it's our job to issue something called a record of decision, or ROD, we usually will say ROD. We're government bureaucrats, we can't help ourselves, we talk in abbreviations and acronyms. Uh, if, you don't, if we're saying one and you know what it is, raise your hand and say, what's that? Anyhow, a ROD, the record of decision, is the document in which we say, okay, this is the decision we've made. And in, in addition to that, we also have with it a responsiveness summary where we summarize all of the responses to every single one of the comments that we've received. We cluster them, if, you know, if 10 people said the same thing, basically, we'll cluster them and give one answer, but we answer every comment that is made, and we put that into a separate document. So, as we said, the public comment period closes one month from today, April 27th. After that, we're gonna be evaluating all of those, and we hope to come up with our record of decision, or our ROD, uh, by the summer or early fall. That's our goal. Depends a little bit on how complicated the comments are that we've received, but that's our goal. So then, once we've issued a decision, we gotta then implement it. The first step of implementation is to design the remedy. It's a very complicated thing to design a remedy like this. You gotta, you gotta narrow canal, you gotta get if there's going to be dredging, and there almost certainly will be, you got to get barges in and out, you got to get dredging equipment in and out, you got to bring the material somewhere, you got to take that mud and process it on an on land facility somewhere. That facility has to be built. There's lots and lots of design work that goes on. We estimate that whole process will take two to three years. And then it gets built after that. As Judith said, we look to the responsible parties, those who, are, who carry the legal responsibility for the contamination that happened 10, 50, 150 years ago. The entities, the companies, the, the entities that carry the legal responsibility for that pollution are the ones to whom we look and say, we now have to look to you to actually carry out the cleanup. So that's the process. We are at that moment right now where we're taking public comment, we're leading up to a record of a decision uh, and with this, I'm going to turn it over to Christos Tsiamis. He's been the project manager since the start. He's going to run through a little slideshow, give you a, a, a summary idea of what it is that we proposed back on December 27th. The canal is within the bounds of this red circle. It extends from uh, about Butler's, Butler Street, from Butler Street to all the way down in Red Hook to uh, where the Amer big green Amerada Hess tanks are, uh, which is down here. During uh, the 150 years of the existence of the canal, a lot of industry uh, was uh, located on either side of the canal, uh, mostly chemical industry. They produced a lot of waste, and uh, if you think that uh, environmental laws went uh, practically into effect, uh, just 40 years ago, for a, over 100 years, uh, chemical waste uh, went into the canal. In addition to that, uh, sewage from uh, the New York City sewage network uh, has been discharging into the canal since the early, at least the early 1900s. So, as a result of that, uh, pollution uh, that I mentioned before that was generated over 150 years, uh, we, create, we are faced with this situation. We, in the, original, uh, the original canal was built on the footprint of the Guanas Creek. So what you see, this is an illustration of what the canal looks uh, like. The, the light brown is the, the sediment that existed there pre-existed industrial activity. So this, this is the, the so-called native sediment of the original Guanas Creek. Creek. 
uh, you can see that there's a band of black material on top of this. This is what was deposited during all those years of industrial activity, uh, which is mainly chemical contamination and also uh, uh, sewage uh, materials deposited from uh, the overflows of the, of the sewers. Uh, at presently, uh, this material ranges, the thickness of this material over the original bottom of the canal ranges from one to 20 feet. Uh, on the average, it's about 10, thick, uh, 10 feet thick. Now, what, what, was, what, is it, what is there in that uh, material? Uh, our investigation showed that there's compounds called, this is a long name, let's say for a short name we'll call them PAHs. These are uh, dozens and dozens of compounds that you find in, in oils, motor oils and other types of oils, and also in coal tar. Uh, there are PCBs, compounds that were used uh, for electrical transformers, very dangerous compounds that were outlawed at the end, uh, uh, at the end of the 1970s. A lot of metals that are toxic, and they are also pure, uh, uh, the non-aqueous phase liquids. These are pure, uh, uh, pure liquid uh, chemical, uh, uh, pure liquid chemicals uh, that are generated uh, during uh, uh, during the processing of coal. It was generated during the process of coal in the manufacturing gas plants that were located on either side of the canal, and and they were. Uh, processing coal in order to uh, uh, produce uh, gas for uh, lighting and heating. Uh, the contamination was, is not only, you know, over the years, moved also into the native sediment. Remember in the previous picture that I showed you, there was a black streak of uh, soft sediment that I mentioned, that was the contamination uh, that uh, overlays the native sediment. However, a lot of contamination moved also into the sands of the original uh, creek uh, sediment. And so in that portion of the, of, of the canal, we have mainly PAHs and the liquid uh, material from the coal tar. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, all these industries have disappeared. But they are still, uh, and, and, and the effects of, uh, and so there is not active uh, disposal of, of chemicals, but there are still some uh, materials that end up into the canal from previous operations. And so the coal tar from the manufacturing gas plants, and I will show you in the next slide where they are, continues to seep into the canal. And you can see today, it's all those brown spots that you see if you are looking at the canal that come up from the bottom and that they eventually spread on the canal and they become a sheen. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the native sediment. Uh, it saturates the native sediment. Uh, also, what you see presently, what keeps going into the canal presently are uh, solids from the overflow of, of the sewers, of, of the city sewers. And uh, this is, you, I'm sure a lot of, of you who have gone by the canal have witnessed that. Uh, someone filmed uh, such a discharge uh, on September of, of 2010. And you can see the material, this is the top of the canal. This is the, the sewer uh, discharge at the top of the canal. And you can see it, uh, you can see it moving down the, the length of the canal. Eventually, those materials deposit at the bottom of the canal and they become part of the contamination. Now, how much contamination do we have into the canal? Well, quite a bit, and, but they are, each uh, portion of the canal has distinct uh, levels of contamination. The worst contamination is in this red outline portion of the canal, the middle of the canal. Uh, the less, uh, some less, what intermed, in, intermediate level of contamination is at the top of the canal, north of the Third Avenue Bridge, and the least contaminated material is uh, south of the, of the of the highway, uh, the, Hamil the Hamilton Avenue Bridge, uh, bordering the the neighborhood of Red Hook. So, having found uh, having found that the canal is contaminated and uh, at levels that present 
risk to human health and the environment, to all the organisms that could live in the canal. Um, we had to come up with uh, a way to clean it up, and that is our preferred remedy. This is what I'm going to talk to you about next. So our preferred remedy is the following. We propose to remove all that soft sediment. Remember that black band that I showed you in, in, the, in the slide in the beginning? Remove all of that, and then since we, still, we, we would still have contamination, because I mentioned that the contamination has moved into the native sediment, into the, of, the, the sands of the native sediment, we propose, and we will have to isolate that contamination from the, the clean surface above and the water, we propose to put a trip layer, which will be a protective layer. In the areas, I mentioned before that among the chemicals that are there, there's a chemical, uh, there's a, a, a pure liquid chemical that has th the tendency to move upwards, you know, a, a coal tar derivative that moves upwards in the canal. Uh, in the areas where that happens, we intend to uh, solidify, stabilize, in a sense, mix the bottom of the canal with some cement-like material so as to prevent uh, any movement of that free liquid chemical upwards uh, into the canal. This approach is for the most contaminated um, uh, areas which are in the middle and the top of the canal. For the lower part of the canal, south of Hamilton Avenue, what we propose is to remove all that uh, material, all that contaminated soft material, and put a triple layer of, uh, a, a triple cap, we call it, it's a triple uh, protective layer that uh, will prevent any contamination remaining behind to come in contact with uh, the clean surface that we will lay and with the water. Uh, in that particular area, we do not have to uh, do any stabilization of the bottom because there are no, uh, uh, there's no free moving liquid. Uh, also, we propose to excavate the, the first street basin. This is an offshoot of the canal uh, just about south of uh, uh, the Carroll Street Bridge that in the past had been, uh, it, it abuts the, the, you know, the main body of the canal, and in the past 50 or so years had been filled with a uh, heavy amount of contamination. So uh, we intend to remove that contamination and restore the, the, the first street basin uh, in its origi original condition with water in it, meaning. And finally, no cleanup of the canal would be perfect unless we prevented the sources that are still contaminating the canal from doing that. In other words, unless we treated the, the, uh, uh, the sources of contamination on either side of the canal. And, and right now, the main sources are the former manufacturing gas plants. I will show you where they are. And the overflows from uh, the New York City sewers. All right, this is, a, this is a, an illustration of what we mean by, by the cap. Remember we said uh, our uh, uh, proposed remedy includes uh, removing all the soft material and putting, an isol uh, uh, and putting a cap, a clean cap. So our clean cap is a three-layer cap. The, the first layer is, uh, uh, consists of, of, uh, of a clay-like material which acts like a sponge and absorbs all these organic dangerous chemicals. That then will be covered by another layer, a sand and gravel layer, so that we can isolate this sponge which is saturated with chemicals. We want to isolate the chemicals from the water above. And since the canal still has, a certain portions of the canal has, uh, first of all, have navigational traffic, they have traffic, there are barges and boats go up and down, and there are also currents in the canal, and they are likely to you know, d disturb these layers, we will put a protective gravel armor layer, you know, uh, consisting of uh, larger stones. And on top of that layer, we will lay some sand so that we create a new habitat for, uh, for the fish and, and other uh, uh, aquatic uh, organisms. Uh, I mentioned before that we were going to also uh, clean up the first street basin. As you can see, the first street basin is this offshoot of the canal right south of, uh, of, uh, of the Carroll Street bridge. 
Uh, this is uh, the, the basin, the, the, the area outlined by the yellow line. I mentioned uh, it, it has been filled. We tested there, there's heavy contamination. We have to remove it, and we thought we might as well restore it to its original uh, use. Now, I mentioned we talked about uh, controlling the sources. Uh, we mentioned that uh, some of the sources were the, the former manufacturing gas plants, and they are located uh, at three locations in the canal. One is the f up there at the uh, near this neighborhood, you know, at the very top of the canal, the, the Fulton former uh, MGP plant. Another one is right in the middle, and and the, another one is uh, by uh, uh, where the Lowe's department store, uh, not department store, um, convenience store, whatever it is. Hardware store, yeah. So, yeah. So, work is already being done for this. EPA will not be cleaning up this, uh, these uh, three former uh, manufacturing gas plants. Uh, New York State has already been working on this. And for this middle uh, uh, plant, uh, this middle site, go ahead. Natalie. So for this middle side, they have decided, they have made the studies, and they have, they, uh, New York State, that is, with National Grid, who is the responsible party, and they have uh, come, uh, they have decided that the way to, uh, to clean it up would be to create a cutoff wall between the side and the canal, uh, to remove any, all the major sources, the major sources of tar that are mobile and are moving towards the canal, and, and then to put uh, some walls Near, I'm sorry, some uh, recovery wells near that, the, the wall, the wall that I mentioned before, so that anything that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's impossible to remove every single uh, uh, source. Uh, the, you know, there are bigger and smaller sources. So they would remove the bigger sources, and, and then uh, anything that's not being, that's still being left in there and is moving towards the canal would be captured at the wall by these recovery wells. So that is their approach. The uh, New York State National Grid have been working at this. Uh, they are towards the end of designing that uh, remedy. Uh, and we expect that uh, since the nature of the contamination is the same at the other size, similar approaches will be employed for the Fulton site up here and for the metropolitan uh, site uh, down by, by Lowe's. Back. Back. So, then I mentioned the other ongoing, uh, the other ongoing uh, source of contamination of the canal are the overflows by uh, the New York sewers. Uh, these overflows bring in uh, particulates, you know, matter that uh, has oil and other chemicals, and eventually they, uh, these things settle at the bottom of the canal and they contribute to the contamination. Now that happens. Uh, these yellow arrows indicate the location of, of, the, of the sewer, of the sewer uh, discharges. Uh, the size of the arrows also shows you the, si the size of the discharge. So the largest discharge happens at the very top of the canal, about 130, 130 million gallons a year of uh, sewage that overflows into the canal. And in the middle of the canal, uh, you have another major uh, discharge. Now, New York City has uh, put together a plan that, uh, to address this problem. Uh, but the plan that New York City has put together addresses those two uh, overflows in the middle and towards the end of the canal. But it does not address the, 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 the top of the canal. So uh, where a lot, of, a lot of material is being discharged. And this brown color inside the canal uh, is an indication of, uh, of the accumulation that has happened in the canal uh, between two, the year 2000, I'm sorry, 2003 and 2010. Uh, so you, you could see that there's a lot of accumulation that happens there, and so we will have to, be, to deal with those uh, uh, overflows at those, uh, at those locations. So here's what, what we have suggested in our remedy. What we have suggested is to, uh, near those locations where those big uh, 
sewer overflows are uh, positioned the very top of the canal and at the bend of the canal to construct uh, these holding tanks, these underground holding tanks. The overflows happen only during storm events. Uh, a lot of water runs down the system. The system, the system cannot uh, uh, cannot hold all that all that water and sewage and chemicals that are in there, and they overflow into the canal. So our proposal is to build these retention tanks. Uh, when a lot of water comes down during the storm water, it will go into these tanks. It will stay there until a day or two, whatever, uh, how long the storm lasts. And then when the storm passes, that material, I mean, that, wa you know, that water, we will be pumped into the treatment plant. Uh, we estimate that uh, an 8 million gallon tank will be needed for the tap uh, overflow in, in, in the vicinity of, uh, uh, of Butler Street. Uh, and uh, a 4 million gallon tank will be required for the uh, uh, CSO, the, the sewer, uh, at uh, the bend of the canal. Go ahead. And we have also proposed locations where these underground tanks, remember this can, these tanks will be underground, they will be, insto they will be installed there, and then all, all types of different structures, parks and whatever, you know, could be built on top of, of, uh, of the tank. Uh, so for the, the turn of the canal, you see this is the, the, street, the third uh, uh, street bridge. Uh, the proposed location is this, which is owned by New York City. It's being used la right now as a salt lot. You know, they store salt for uh, the icing of the streets, I imagine. And for the top of this is the top of the canal. The proposed, the potential location is uh, the, this lower part of, of the Thomas Green Park, which uh, uh, happens to be also in the footprint of the, of the former uh, food and manufacturing gas plant. Go ahead. Okay, so, so this is what we propose to do with, uh, uh, with the dredging of the sediment, with removing the sediment, and also with, uh, uh, with controlling the sources. Uh, we estimate that we're going to remove about 600,000 cubic yards of sediment, and so our proposal has also ways of, of treating that sediment. And uh, mainly we have two ways. Uh, one is for the very, very contaminated material that contains the, the free liquid that I mentioned. It would be sent off-site to facilities that would thermally treat it and destroy those, uh, those organics. Uh, for material that has less contamination, for sediment that has less contamination, we would send it again, again off-site and it would be treated in a way that mixes that material with uh, cement-like uh, uh, materials. It creates a new a form of aggregate material that could be used beneficially in, in certain uh, types of uh, applications, such as uh, uh, creating a, a cover for, uh, for a landfill. Uh, we also, uh, for the last, the area that's in the south of the canal, uh, abutting uh, Red Hook, and which has the, the least contaminated material, uh, we also had an option that uh, that material could be uh, stabilized, in other words, mixed with uh, cement-like materials and so that uh, it becomes non-toxic, and, and then stored in a facility uh, near Red Hook. Uh, that facility would be basically uh, a, a space created by dewatering a portion of the harbor in there and filling it in with that solidified material. Uh, this, op this is an option. We have the option to do it this way or the option to send it uh, away and stabilize it as I'm, you know, we are doing with the rest of the material. And that option is, uh, would only be uh, considered if uh, it had the support of the community. So, how much is it going to cost? We estimate it's going to cost between 467 and 504 million dollars. And the lower number, the 467 million, uh, would apply only if we stored the, the sediment that we removed from the lower part of the canal, the one that 
is near Red Hook and, and stored it in, in the type of facility that uh, I mentioned to you before. Uh, go ahead. So this is our schedule. As uh, Walter mentioned before, we ha you have until uh, April 27th to submit comments to us about the plan. Uh, we will consider those comments and we will put together our, far, our final plan in, in a document called the Record of Decision and we anticipate that that could be done by the end of, of the summer, of this summer, 2013. Then we have three years of design and uh, we anticipate that uh, in six years after that we will be able to finish the whole project. In other words, it would take us about two years per section of the canal, the upper, the middle and the bottom. Thank you. Thank you, Christos. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Natalie Loney. I'm the Community Involvement Coordinator um, on the Gowanus Canal. Um, I just wanted to reiterate some of the things that Christos has said. Um, the comment period for this proposed plan ends on April 27th. The email address where you can send comments to us. Um, it's gowanuscanalcomments.region2 at epa.gov, along with our mailing address to send comments. So if you have any issues, if you have any concerns, if you have any questions, contact us, um, contact me if you have additional questions, um, and then get your comments in by the 27th. Um, and, and you can call me, it's as simple as picking up the phone and calling me or sending me an email. Moving forward, um, once the remedy is selected, there's still a lot of work that's gonna have to be done in the community. Um, designing the remedy and actual implementation. And that's really where the rubber hits the road. When the implementation, all, everything right now for for most of us is somewhat theoretical, but when you actually see excavation taking place at the canal, I don't want anyone to be like, wait, 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 what is this? There's a Superfund site here? So I just wanna make sure that at least you have an opportunity to become more aware of what's going on at the site. And so when we're moving forward with the remediation, you can participate and have your, your views, your concerns shared and addressed. The CAG is a community advisor, stands for Community Advisory Group. And that is a group of people representing many different entities within the communities. All right, so thank you so much.